We are continuing in the Gospel of John, and we are in chapter 16 this morning. And when I was thinking about how to, how to talk about this passage, it seemed to me to be hard words of great hope, and I'm going to walk through what I mean by that this morning, Christ giving hard words of great hope. So let's go ahead and uh, read our passage. If you're able to, please stand with me uh, for the reading of God's Word. We stand just to honor the reading of God's Word, and we're going to be reading the first 15 verses here in John chapter 16. Beginning in verse 1, this is the Word of the Lord. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father, nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Lord God, please bless the reading and the preaching of your word this morning, God. Lord, I pray that you'd bless our time. I pray that the songs we sing would honor you, God. I pray that the thoughts we think would be out of a love and an affection for you, God. And I pray that the things we say would point one another to you and would glorify your name, God. We're thankful this morning. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. So, as I said, we're continuing in John and we've been continuing for quite some time in, in what could be termed the farewell discourse chapters um, or the upper room discourse chapters. This is Christ, again, pouring into his disciples, those specifically those, those 12, 11 now, but those 12 that he had gathered close to himself. And he's pouring into them only hours removed away from the events of the cross. John spends, in fact, most of his gospel in this section, those kind of preparation chapters for what would come takes up just as much space in John's gospel uh, as does the first three years of Christ's ministry. That's how important these words are. So with all that in, in mind, we might consider first off, why did Christ speak in ways that were so challenging and so controversial? Why such, why such hard words and such, such depth of teaching? Why was this not like a, a rah, rah, rah before the, before the final? Like Why was this not like an upbeat, peppy rallying call? But instead, why is there such depth to Christ's words in this final hour? If you, if you just think about where we've been in the gospel, last week Christ encouraged his followers by assuring them that the world would hate them just as it hated him. You can find that in chapter 15, verse 18. Because of that, their hate, the world's hatred of his followers, his disciples were assured that the world would persecute them. You find that in the last chapter in verses 20 through 21. That's how Christ is building this encouragement and building his followers. Now, these assurances that Christ is giving, these, these all follow from that set up in the beginning of chapter 15 where Christ says he is the vine and his disciples, including you, if you are in Christ, are the branches he being the vine, you being the branches. And then based on that analogy or that scenario, Christ says, because you are branches, abide in the vine and love one another. Again, he's pointing toward the cross. He's thinking about the persecution that will come, the spread of the church. And he's wanting his disciples to be grounded in something, something real, something tangible, something life-giving, which is abiding in Christ. And then because Christ is working through us, we will then love one another. But with all that in mind, why in this passage, with words of encouragement, do we have such weighty themes? 
Why such, why such difficult matters? Look at verse 1. Christ says, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. This is why there's depth in this passage. This is why there's weight to these words of Christ. I've said these things, he says, to keep you from falling away. Why such weighty words? Precisely because Christ doesn't want them to fall away. If, if you think about this, Paul is one that, that speaks frequently of physical exercise. A lot of Paul's letters, he kind of uses those metaphors of running. Um, he uses metaphors of, of growing strong. Anybody who's dedicated time to building muscle uh, knows that building muscle takes time, right? It, it, it takes endurance. It takes stamina. Um, it takes perseverance. And, and a lot of times it takes a little bit of pain. Typically, if you're in the gym and you're having a good time and just like stress-free, you're not going to build much muscle, right? Like you have to exert yourself in order to do that. The older I get, the more you have to exert yourself. And then things don't work right, but that's a topic for another day. Um, anything like that, mastering an academic subject, if you want to speak a language well, it takes those same, those same characteristics, endurance, patience, um, a little bit of pain at times. Mastering anything or, or developing anything worthwhile that will stand the test of time is going to require much of the same things. Now, if, if you think about Christ's instructions in those terms, Christ is giving stern warnings, stern warnings amidst this encouragement, precisely so that they will be prepared for what lies ahead. It's not for no reason that Christ's encouragement includes a lot of warnings and a lot of stern rebukes. Christ knows this is exactly the training that they need for what is to come and what will be coming ahead of them. Um, in theological circles, a lot of times we'll refer to this as a means of God's grace. Not as God's saving grace, but God's persevering grace. In other words, when, when Christ gives these warnings and he gives these cautions, those cautions and those words of warning in Scripture are the means through which God perseveres his saints, preserves his saints, carries us through. So if we're to think, how does God do the sanctifying process of walking us through this life? We've talked about this at great length in John, right? Christ is holding us. We're securing God's hand. God will surely bring us through to the end. How is it that he does it? Through these type of words, strong words, sometimes words of rebuke. This is the means through which the Holy Spirit specifically keeps us in Christ. We'll talk more about that a little later, but just consider this for a moment. This is how Christ prepares us for challenges. What the disciples are facing is not, not doldrums. They're not facing a long period of boredom. Things are about to pick up quickly. They're about to see things that they're going to have to, they're going to reel because they're grappling with what they're going to see happen to Christ, happen to one another in the persecution that would follow. And yet, we're also going to see an explosion of the church and of the gospel. How does Christ prepare them for that? He prepares them with an hours and hours and hours long sermon, essentially, is what we're reading through. This discourse is essentially Christ preaching for several hours to his disciples in those final waning moments as he's spending every waking minute with them and they with him. This is how Christ is preparing them. And the fruit of that discourse is going to show in the coming days, in the coming weeks, in the coming months. If you've read the book of Acts, it looks like a nuclear bomb going off, right? Just churches flying out everywhere, Christians spreading in the face of persecution. How does that happen? From this. Here's the foundations for what's to come. Now, when I was reading this, I could not help but think uh, about Christian discipleship and Christian sermons. Um, a long sermon does not necessarily make it a good sermon. Can I have an amen? <laughs> um, in fact, one of my, one of my uh, resolutions in this new year was to kind of keep a cap on my sermons and trim them down just a little bit. None of you noticed. That's okay. I forgive you. As, as we just said, I'm called to love you as we are in the vine and you, we are all the branches. So no, um, but, it, but you also know that anytime you tell a story worth telling, it takes a minute. Um, what, what do your kids say? If you have kids, what do your kids say when a 20 minute or 30 minute Marvel show comes on? Wow, that was short, right? What happens when you go to the movie theater and you see a Batman movie that's an hour long? No, they needed three hours to tell that story of the, of the Batman movie. Any story worth telling. We're used to that in almost every other facet of life. We understand that if there's going to be time for you to teach a class during the week, if there's going to be time for you to pour into your children, it's going to take a little bit more than 10-second 10 sec 10 soundbite. So I was curious, and I started looking, 
And I wanted to know, like, how long do people tend to pour into the church? If this is Christ pouring for hours into his disciples to prepare them for the fruit that's to come, how do we mimic Christ in those regards? Well, evangelicals, which I would count us loosely as an evangelical church, um, that term gets thrown around a little bit loosely sometimes is why I say it like that. But evangelicals typically preach for longer than most congregations. Um, averages are tough because you've always got the churches that are way up here and the churches that are way down there, but average about 39 minutes for an evangelical sermon. You keep looking and mainline Protestant denominations typically preach for about 25 minutes. If you keep on stretching that out, and if you look at the Roman Catholic religion, for example, their homilies, which is an equivalent of a sermon, are 14 minutes long on average. When I was looking at that, I, I started thinking How does that play out? How does that fruit, how is that fruit working for us? Um, According to the most recent studies, half of evangelicals attend church weekly. And that's 33% or about a third for mainline Protestants. So even of those sermons, you're only hearing half on average or a third on average if you're in the mainline Protestant circles. And in fact, according to a 2020 study, Ligonier does this massive study called State of Theology. 2020, they discovered half of evangelicals, evangelicals, view church attendance as unnecessary. Half. That's pre-COVID, by the way. Now consider this. Half of evangelicals also agree that man is basically good, and half agree that God accepts the, religion, or the worship of all religions, including Islam and Orthodox Judaism, that deny the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, you could, you could push back on me here, and I, I understand. You could say, well, Josh, that's anecdotal evidence. There's other, there's other factors involved. Can we at least just maybe suggest this? Christ prepared his followers through strong, regular instruction, and the fruit of that was undeniable. We are walking through, over the course of months, what Jesus was pouring into them over hours and hours and hours of instruction. On top of three and a half years of walking with him, the fruit is undeniable. Now, on the contrary... I can confidently say this. Western Christianity is preparing disciples that are tragically infrequent church followers, doctrinally feeble, biblically weak instructed, and the results are becoming adamantly evident. I mean every one of those forceful words. It is a tragic state where Western Christianity is that half of the most conservative religious group we can identify, which is evangelicals, would say worship of Christ is not even a prerequisite. How tragic is that? I say all that not to say good on us and bad on everybody else. This is, that, that's not the point. What I am suggesting, though, is if we're called to abide in the vine, there's content to abiding. There's regularity to abiding. There is closeness to abiding. Abiding cannot be relegated to a 14-minute sermonette on a Sunday morning that I hear half the Sundays. That is not going to suffice for a branch that is called to thrive and abide in the vine that is Christ. Let me move on before I get more red in the face. Verse 2. Verse 2, Christ continues. He says, They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. Put yourself in the disciples' shoes for a moment there and imagine hearing these words from Christ. These are terrifying words. Pretty soon, not only will you be put out of the synagogue, which is to say everything that your social life was built around, everything that your family structure was built around, probably the way you make your living, everything in life that you have security or even even tangible hope in is going to be removed when you're removed from the synagogue. That would become regular practice in the early church. Uh, Many, many who turned to Christ would be socially, religiously, familially, in every regard, ostracized from the social group they used to belong to. And, And in a lot of ways, that's not unfamiliar to a lot of Christians, even today. Now, now we live in the United States where it is still um, acceptable for you to claim the name of Christ. And I say acceptable kind of loosely. We understand what that means. But typically, your family won't walk away from you. But I know Christians, even in the United States, who it has broken their relationship with their family to follow Christ. If we were to spread that and to think overseas, consider the risk that some Christians take. Where very easily, they they could be not only ostracized from family, but facing death. Or a lack of income, not able to provide for their family, which is almost like a death sentence for many people. American Christians frequently have have kind of avoided some of these risks. These risks that Christ gives to his disciples as as preparation for what would come. I mean, it's it's led us to say certain things like, no, there's two things you don't discuss at at the American dinner table, which are religion and politics. 
how have we gotten to that state? I understand politics. That, that, that wears me out as much as it does you. How do we not talk about God at our dinner table? I would wager Deuteronomy 6 tells you you're commanded to talk about God at your dinner table. Please don't remove religion from your dinner table. Further, we're told that some will even be killed. Death might come to them. Again, think you're in the shoes of the apostles. These are Christ's words to you. Some of you will face death. Um, I know Dave's been walking through uh, early church history. One of the early church fathers, Tertullian, uh, was credited with saying very famously, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And that was true for centuries of the early church. It's been true for the entirety of Christian history. As isolated or as insulated, maybe we could say, as we have been from that. And praise God for his protections. But for many Christians throughout the centuries, this bore true, and it bore true forcefully. If you were to think about like the hall of faith, for example, um, in Hebrews chapter 11, just listen to how the author of Hebrews describes this. When he's looking back and he's thinking of this spiritual lineage that we have come from, he says, and what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Can you feel the powerful language that he is using there? Can you feel the experience that these Christians would soon be walking through? Let me suggest two things from this. The first thing is, for a Christian, we should expect death for following Christ. And I say that not to say that I fully expect to be martyred on my way home today. I really don't. I don't think I'll be martyred on my way home today. But what I mean is, in the same vein that Paul in Romans 6 says, I consider myself dead and alive in Christ. In that regard, Christians should expect death. In fact, we should render that as one of the first steps of Christian discipleship. De dead to yourself, alive in Christ. Second thing I would say, though, is those who persecute you, even to death, just as those we just walked through in Hebrews 11, will often consider themselves offering sacrifice to God. Now, let's pause there for a minute because that should strike you as very odd, right? How is it that somebody comes to the place that they would kill a Christian one who is boldly just proclaiming the love and mercy and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they would consider it offering service to God. This isn't, this isn't ardent atheism. This isn't someone denying the existence of God. This is somebody actually claiming to a form of religion and killing Christians. How is that possible? We might ask Paul. Think of Paul's testimony. Paul, who before God saved him, was holding the coats for those who were stoning Stephen to death. You can pick up on that in Acts chapter 6 and 7. We could ask Paul about such a, such a, such a reaction and, 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 and the reaction of those who are persecuting to have religious, spiritual justification for what they're doing. I, I would put this out there. Some of the harshest vitriol and hatred against Christians throughout the centuries of the entire Christian church has not come from the unbelieving world. It hasn't come from the atheists. It hasn't come from the agnostics. It hasn't even oftentimes uh, come from those of other religions. Oftentimes, it's those who claim a form of religion and yet deny Jesus Christ. It's those who say they are following God and yet they do not know Jesus. These are the ones that Christians have been persecuted by. And Christ here is warning them of this. Some will persecute you even to death and they will regard it as serving God to kill Christ's followers. Why is this all happening? It's happening because Christ says the hour is now here. The hour is now here. So we might ask the hour of what? What hour are we talking about? Most of you who have been with me through this John series, you're starting to pick up on that word when John uses it. For so long, Christ has been holding that hour at bay. My time has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Um, we heard about that in chapter 2 and chapter 7 and chapter 8. 
three times in chapter 8. My hour has not yet come, but now something has changed. What has changed? Those things of the end are dawning in the work of Jesus Christ. Those things, and when I say those things of the end, there's dark parts of that, I would say, and light parts of that. Or we could say weighty matters and joyful matters. There's those matters of you will face persecution. You will face hatred by the world. You will especially face hatred by those who claim to worship God and yet do not know Christ. And yet, what are the positives? You have eternal life. You have the indwelling of the Spirit. You have fellowship with God. You have the communion of the saints. All these blessings with all the persecution that follows, all of this is dawned in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's why here in this passage he says, the hour has come. It's time. These things are about to start transpiring. Verse 3, he says, And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. Christ is kind of giving us that glimpse behind the curtain here, I think. He's giving us the, the behind-the-scenes the behind the scenes reason. The people that stoned Stephen, I'm sure each of them could have given you an explanation for what they were doing. But I bet it wasn't the right one. Christ here is giving you the true reason. Why was it that someone would pick up a rock and throw it at Stephen of all people? The reason, they do not and have not known the Father, nor do they know Christ. They do not know. And when I say no, I don't mean that they didn't know the name of God or even know of this God. Who was stoning Stephen? Religious men. Men that had memorized scripture. Men that certainly knew the name of Yahweh and would have claimed to have been following him and would have claimed to have been doing service by killing this man Stephen. The problem with the Jewish leaders here is not just rejecting Christ. That's a huge problem and we'll walk through that in a minute. But Christ here is revealing the real reason. They never knew the Father in the first place. They never truly knew God, because if they had known God, they would have known his son. Christ is looking here, and if you think about this, this is during the time that the city was swelling, right? Christ is up here in the upper room. He's gathered with his disciples, and yet on the street below, probably hundreds of thousands of religious Jews teeming on the streets. Just, just imagine this press of people, people who were the, praying to the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, um, people who had memorized the scriptures and they're quoting the Old Testament to each other. Um, people who were observing the sacrifices and the rituals. And yet many of those people, if not most of those people, did not follow the God they claimed to follow. Did not know the God that they claimed to serve. That's the picture here in, in our passage. If you were to think about this in today's, in a similar vein, it's, it's, it's quite possible, or, or we might say it's even inevitable, um, for somebody to regularly attend a Christian church, you might observe our ordinances and our worship. You, you sing the songs, you, you take the bread, you pray to Jesus. You may even profess publicly to follow him, maybe even going through a baptism. You may read scripture daily, and yet you may not know the Christ you claim to serve. Think about the shock of that. These are tough words and tough warnings why is Christ giving this to his disciples? Because they're about to hear a whole lot of people who claim to follow the Father chanting, crucify him, crucify him to the Son of God. In the same vein, we will regularly encounter those who claim to follow Jesus Christ, and yet they will demonstrate by their actions that they never knew either Christ nor the Father who sent him. This is very, very important because going back to that analogy at the beginning of chapter 15, if you're a branch of the good tree you're going to look like the tree or the vine, excuse me, I'm mixing my metaphors. If we're connected to Christ who is the vine, you're going to be a vine that follow, or a branch that follows from that vine. Good trees do not produce bad fruit. The vine will not produce those who hate the vine and reject the one who sent the vine. Quite frankly, our actions show where our hearts truly lie. Verse 4, Christ said, But I've said these things to you that when their hour comes... You may remember that I told them to you. Now, here's an important part, and I don't want you to miss this because this has been heavy on the front end, right? Can you feel the weight of this passage? Christ says this not so that they're feeling downcast. Christ does not say these things so that they're confused. Christ does not say these things so they're terrified or huddled in a corner. Why does Christ tell them, you will be persecuted and some of you killed for my name's sake? And in this case, all save John will face death in their persecution. Why does Christ tell them this? So that they will be prepared when the hour comes. Not scared, not terrified, not running to the hills, not distrusting God, but trusting fully 
strong in faith when that hour comes that they will stand tall. I, I was thinking about this this week so much, um, and we talked a little bit about it, about it on, a, on Wednesday night, that we as Christians, we're called to be the watchers on the wall. We're called to be, in other words, prepared for what God says will surely assail his children. If God says they will persecute you, we should be prepared for persecution. We should be prepared for hardship. When those times do come and when the press is on, it will reveal what sort of preparation we've truly been doing as Christians. Second thing this morning, what do these things lead to? What do these things lead to? Let's, let's keep moving in verse 4. The latter part of verse 4 says this, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, Christ said, but now I'm going to him who sent me and none of you asks me, where are you going? Let's pause there for just a second. So Christ says here, I'm telling you these things for what is to come. Now, immediately for the disciples, what is in view here? Very soon, they're going to see Christ beaten, bloodied, and tortured, and then led to the Roman cross, hoisted up on the cross, and he will breathe his last, truly dying and being buried in a tomb. That's what they're about to witness there. The persecution is going to kind of froth over. We've, we, I've described it as bubbling on the streets. This is where it's going to just boil over the edges of the pot. The Romans will clamp down on Christians in the coming years. You'll see fierce persecution of the Christian church. That's what's leading. But let's, let's look here at this passage again. Verse 6, he said, Because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. We might, we might, let me pause there again. We might see that the weight of these things may be weighing on them. Why would sorrow fill their hearts? If Christ is trying to encourage them and equip them for what is to come, why would sorrow then fill their hearts? You might think, as I did when I first glanced at this passage, you might think, oh, this is sorrow because of the persecution. Christ has said hard things to them, right? You're going to be persecuted. Some people are going to want to kill you. And the disciples then are downcast, right? They're deflated. We have, we have no more, no more uh, strength in us. We're sorrowful. These are hard words that you've said to us. We may lose worldly goods. We may lose the way we provide for our families. We have, may have difficulty on the road ahead. That's not where the, the sorrow rises. If you look at this passage and reread it and reread it and look at where their eyes are pointing, their sorrow is very clear. Where is it? It's in Christ's departure. Christ has just told them, some of you will die for me. And where does their mind and heart go? To him, to fellowship with him, not on their circumstances, not on the, the things that he's just warned them about. They're drinking in that discipleship, and yet where is their heart troubled? Christ is going to leave? You're not going to be by our side anymore? This is where the whole passage is pointing to. And yet, in a way, they're distracted by his coming absence. They're distracted by his coming absence. Christ here says, I'm looking back to verse 5, he said, None of you asks me, where are you going None of you asked me. Now, if you're thinking about the Gospel of John, that may sound odd because they've asked him several times, why are you leaving? What's going on, right? They've been asking several questions. So what is Christ pointing to here? They're worried about him leaving. Christ is pointing them toward, you should be worried about the destination to which I'm leaving. You're focused on my absence, Christ says. You should be focused on where I will be present. In other words, if, if we were to think about this, which is better to have Christ walking beside you, limited in time and space, or to have Christ ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, mediating ever for his children, praying constantly, and one day again to come in glory to judge the living and the dead. Which of those pictures is better? It sounds crazy for us to think there could be something better than walking beside Christ in this time. What could be better than that? Christ tells us what could be better than that. What you and I enjoy today is better. It is better, he said, that he would go, that he would indwell his sheep with his spirit, and that he would soon again come to judge the living and the dead. In other words, Christ's absence might bring us sorrow. It brought the disciples sorrow. They were sorrowful to know that Christ would not physically walk with them very soon. However, his destination should fill us with hope. That's the difference here. The physical absence may bring sorrow. The destination to which Christ is going, that's where our hope and our faith lie. The fact that Christ is ever interceding for his children. We'll walk through that more in, in chapter 17. But let's look back at the text. Verse 7, he said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. 
It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Let's pause there for a minute. We're told that we're not being left alone. And Christ's disciples here are being assured. I'm not leaving you alone, he says. He says he's going to send the Holy Spirit, who here he refers to as the helper. Um, It's probably capitalized in your text. The helper is going to come in a special way and be with God's children from here on in a special way. And I would also just point out the fact that John wants you to know about the work of the Holy Spirit. John wants you to know about that. We, We as Christians are Trinitarians. And I know that a lot of us trip over how to even describe the Trinity. And we say things like, well, we can't understand it, but we say it anyway. Or we say, you know, some silly things like that. Um, we can admit that it's tough, but we worship one God in three persons. And this is vital. And we shouldn't be embarrassed to regularly confess this to each other. Father, Son, and Spirit. Three persons, one God. That is the core belief of Christian orthodoxy. Here, we're seeing evidence that the Holy Spirit is not some impersonal force. He's not some disembodied power. He's not like the force from Star Wars or some some force field that goes out. But that's how we think about the Holy Spirit oftentimes, don't we? We'll hear ourselves saying things like it about the Holy Spirit. And yet, who do we see here? We see that he's a person. He, the Holy Spirit, is a person. One God, three persons. Note what Christ says here. He says, I will send him to you, Christ said. I will send him, not it, him. When we worship God, we worship God as Father, Son, and Spirit. Three persons, one God, or one God and three persons. And I encourage you as a Christian, make that part of your prayer life. Make that part of your thought life, your devotional life. This is vital for us to grasp. Now, what I do want to point out is, this doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit's been absent up until this point. Um, If you're doing that Bible reading plan, which I know you are, No chuckles today, so I guess you guys all got on board with it. Um, If you're reading through the Old Testament, though, you know the Holy Spirit has been active. The Holy Spirit has always, as one of the persons in the Godhead, always been active. I mean, in fact, if you you read just the very opening uh, portions of Genesis, we see that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters in the very act of creation. The Holy Spirit is active from beginning to end. So we're not saying that just now the Spirit is coming. What we are saying is now the Spirit will come in the stead of Christ to accomplish great things. He picks up on that in verse 8. He says, talking about the Spirit, When He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in Me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see Me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Let's pause there and walk through that just a little bit. Christ is telling us what this ministry of the Holy Spirit is going to look like. And I think that's important in our day and age because many groups have felt the need to experientialize the Holy Spirit to an unhealthy degree or to make up for our own sake what the Holy Spirit looks like. Let's see what Christ says the Holy Spirit's ministry looks like. First, he says, the Spirit convicts the world. Convicts the world. I've mentioned before, John uses world in a lot of different ways. Um, At least seven, possibly 11 different types of uses for this world cosmos or world. But when we hear that the Spirit will convict the world, we may think, how is that? Because Christ just got done telling his followers, there's going to be a lot of people out there that don't accept me. In fact, there's going to be a lot of people persecuting you and even wanting to kill you so much they will hate me. So how is it then that the Spirit convicts the world? It's not the same sort of conviction that we walk through when we talk about a believer. If you're a Christian, part of your testimony, if you're having a Trinitarian testimony, part of your testimony should be that the Spirit of God convicted you of sin and wooed you to the person of Jesus Christ, drew you to Him. Whatever language you might use, the Holy Spirit worked in your heart to cause you to want to love Christ. That's part of our testimony. Here, this conviction is a little bit more general. In other words, Christ is saying the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, He will convict the world, confront the world with its rejection of Christ. He will lay it all bare, their rejection and denial of the person and work of Jesus Christ. We can see that if we walk through these three things that he lists. He says the Spirit will do three things, uh, convict them of three things. The first thing is sin. The Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin. And he says, because they do not believe in me. What we mean by this is the world in its rejection of Christ makes God a liar. Think about, think about that for a moment. If someone says, I do not believe in Jesus Christ, that may sound rather amicable, right? 
they're not really opposing God. They just, they, they're, they're not on board with this Christianity thing. They, they just don't quite get it. Think about how Scripture is describing this. When, when someone says, I do not believe in Christ, they're calling God a liar. And I say this because John says this in his letter in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 10. He said, whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has born concerning his Son. It's a heavy thing to reject Christ. And John wants you to be clear. God has spoken and he said, you all have a massive problem and yet I have provided the perfect solution. Turn to him and be saved. Those who reject that perfect saving message of God are calling God a liar and saying, you have not done what you said you have done and we will not believe in your son. Rejection of Christ is a rejection of God and making God to be a liar. So the Holy Spirit will convict of sin. Second, though, it says the Holy Spirit will convict of righteousness because I go to the Father. Because I go to the Father. When Christ goes to that cross, and we're going we're gonna to get here in the coming weeks, we'll be in the Easter season, and we'll be thinking a lot and praying a lot about this thing that Christ has done on the cross, that he came, that he died, but then that he rose, and not just rose from the grave, but then ascended to the Father. Both of those vitally important. The fact that Christ rose bodily from the grave, conquering sin and death, and then ascended to the Father, went back to his throne, so to speak, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, overseeing all of his creation, holding all authority, and being with us forever with his, with his spirit. Both of those are vitally important. But what those things mean is, those are like the capstones of Christ's ministry. This is validating everything that Christ has told his followers. All these instructions, all of these warnings, all these words of God will be validated when they see Christ walk out of that tomb. Conversely, remember where we are. The Holy Spirit will convict the world concerning righteousness. In other words, the Holy Spirit will lay bare through the, through the scriptures that God has acted in the work and person of Jesus Christ. It's a glorious thing for those that believe, but it's also a conviction for those who are rejecting this message. The third thing, he says, judgment. The Holy Spirit will convict the world through judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. The ruler of this world is judged. I could preach another sermon on this, but I'll save you because I see my time is, is running down a bit. But we've walked through this before, if you remember. Back in John chapter 12, we were told that the ruler of this world was cast out. You remember that? And we talked about how Satan was defeated in the work of Christ. He reiterated that in chapter 14. Again, we're told the ruler of this world was coming, but he said he has no hold on me. In other words, his power has been taken. His place has been evicted. He has no power on me, Christ said. Here, he says that the Holy Spirit will convict the world because the ruler of this world is judged. Satan has been laid low, restrained and defeated in the work of Christ. Part of what we celebrate through that cross, there's manifold blessings that come from what Christ did on the cross. But one of those things is he defeated our adversary. Now, you may look around and say, there's a lot of evil in this world, Josh. We can watch the news and see a whole lot of evil. There's people dying uh, in Ukraine today. And there's been people dying for 2,000 years since Christ came. In what regard is Satan defeated then? Satan is defeated because no longer can he accuse God's children no longer can he preclude our preaching of the gospel. No longer can he stand in opposition of God building his kingdom. In other words, God says he's out there and there's a final defeat coming. He's angry. He's like a wounded lion prowling around looking for easy prey. But don't make this mistake, Christian. Satan, if you are in Christ, has no hold on you. No power to exercise. No wall to put up in front of you. No, no way to trip your feet. God says, I hold you and he has been defeated. Grab hold of that truth this morning. Let me conclude with this third point. How will these things endure then? How will these things endure? Preserve his disciples. Walk them through these steps that they're going to have to walk very soon. Verse 12, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Let me just say, let me just say this one little comment about those words. Think about all that Christ has said. If you had to walk through the previous couple of chapters in one sermon, and you heard all this for the first time from the perfect mouth of Christ, this would be heavy. This would be 
liberating and, and uplifting and yet at the same time weighty and you're trying to wrap your mind around it. God is so gracious with his children. He stoops to talk to us. He's gentle with his provision. That's why we treasure scripture. God didn't throw this book at us. He lovingly provided us with everything we need in scripture. But he also understands we're frail in our understanding. Verse 13, he says, when the spirit of truth comes, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears from me, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. I'll continue. He will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Verse 15, all that the father has is mine. Therefore, I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Just two thoughts on this final conclusion to the passage. And we'll probably dip into this a little bit next week as we continue in this study. But the first thing is we are wholly and completely dependent on God for truth. And I mean that in every sense of the phrase. We are wholly and completely dependent on God for all truth. Not just the truth concerning our salvation, but the truth concerning good and evil, the truth concerning right and wrong, the, the truth concerning which way to walk and which paths to avoid. All that we need, God says he provides his children. Secondly, though, we believe that God gives us sufficient truth. In other words, if you were a Christian and you have a job decision coming up, there may not be a book of second opinions, chapter three, that tells you do this at work and don't do this at work. The Bible is not a day-by-day how-to manual. But what we must wrap our hearts around, though, is God says he gives you everything needed for every decision, every thought, every plan, every step. Everything in the Christian life is provided for in this word. And I say that because God says it. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we've done 16, but let me get, get, get us to 17 as well. 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now listen to this part, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That's what we mean when we say scripture is sufficient. God has not given us a bit of what we need. He hasn't given us the good start to what we need. He hasn't given us only the things relating to our salvation and yet nothing for how to live a Christian life. No, God says he's given you all that you need. It's why we dwell in this word. We teach this word. We pray this word. We recite this word. This is lifeblood for the Christian. Let me wrap this up. And like I said, we'll dip back into this passage a little bit next week, but where might we look for encouragement in this life? Christians need encouragement in every day and age, um, but we live in weird times. I think every Christian's probably said that, but I truly feel like th these are odd times to be a Christian. There's a lot of things swirling. There's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of things that, that, are, that are disturbing in the news cycle. Um, we live in trying times, let's say, times that could become more trying. How then can we look for encouragement? Two things. First, look to Christ. Firmly, repeatedly, regularly, Train your eyes. And I mean train. Like an athlete preparing for a race, train your eyes on Christ. This is, this is the tenor of this whole passage. When Christ gives them what they need to endure, he says, look at me. Abide in me. Fix your eyes and your heart's desires and the thoughts that you have in private and the words you speak in secret. Focus them all on me. Second thing is, though, I would say as we look to Christ... Look to what Christ has promised. Christ has promised to you that it is better for you, that he is not standing here physically because he says he sends the Holy Spirit to indwell every believer and that you will glorify the Father as you follow the Son. Dwell on the promises that Christ has given us. Train your eyes and your thoughts and your affections on the one who has saved us. This is where encouragement came then. This is where encouragement has come for 2,000 years. This is where encouragement will always be found for the Christian. If times are hard and things are scary, look firmly to Christ and trust in his promises. Let me close with a word from Numbers chapter 6 that you're beginning to know well. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I thank you for this morning, God. I thank you for your people and the massive encouragement they are. Lord, we are, we are all imperfect and we, we know we all sin. 
Lord, but I, I can't express the encouragement that I get from speaking with fellow believers, knowing that they share the same struggles that I share, knowing that they say, share the same passions that I have, knowing that as different as we all are in this room, Lord, we have one thing that unites us, and that is a love for your Son. God, I pray that as, as things are dark, or even just as things are unknown, Lord, the fear of the unknown is oftentimes more challenging for us than, than the presence of actual danger. God, I pray that when we don't know where to step or where to turn, we're not sure what tomorrow may bring, God, I pray that we would remember that Christ has spoken all that we need, has provided us with something sufficient for life and godliness, and has promised to carry us through to the end. God, we thank you that we are held securely in your hands. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us this week. I pray that we would share the gospel regularly, and I pray that we would grow in our love for you. It's all in Christ's name that I pray. Amen.